Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm joined by Dr. Stephen Gangestad. He is Distinguished Professor Emeritus at the University of New Mexico. His research interests include social behavior, interpersonal relationships, social slash personality psychology, psychopathology and health related behavior as informed by evolutionary psychology. So, Dr. Gangestad, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Okay, it's my pleasure. Okay, so let's start with this. I've already asked this to <laughs> Lars Penke and Marty Hazelton, but back in age best 2019, there was sort of a controversy there surrounding the evolutory shift hypothesis and if I get it correctly, uh, Lars Pinkus agrees that there, there's an increase in sexual desire during ovulation for women, but he doesn't agree with you and Marty Hazelton when you say that the evidence points toward uh, there being sometimes, uh, that sometimes the sexual desire is directed at uh, men that are not uh, there partner so uh -huh. uh, i mean and this has to do with the fact that uh, sometimes w the women's partners are not or don't exhibit certain traits like for example physical traits they are not as muscular they are not as physically attractive and dominant so i mean could you tell us a bit about that and what is your position now right so, I mean, the, 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 this area has a bit of a history, you know, it has a long history. And uh, initially, way back in the 1990s, Randy Thornhill and I, uh, and then subsequently some others, started looking at these preference shifts. Originally, our, our interest in preference shift was really to try to understand something about what, what bodily symmetry was telling you, because we measure symmetry, what we looked at to assess whether it potentially had to do with sort of genetic qualities is to look whether females would particularly prefer the scent of a symmetrical man when they were in the fertile phase of their cycle. So it was really using this fertility shift as a means of testing something about symmetry. Ultimately, the focus then became on the fertility shift. And there were a number of people who did studies that showed that, for instance, facial masculinity was more preferred by women who were so-called fertile in their cycle. Uh, vocal masculinity, bodily masculinity or muscularity, uh, behavioral characteristics, and so on. So there was a literature that developed, that emerged. Um, originally, when we were looking at this, we weren't really thinking about this, at least I wasn't, in a broader kind of evolutionary, I would say more of phylogenetic perspective. Where did this come from and so on? In fact, the focus was really kind of on what's going on during the fertile phase, taking for granted what was going on outside of it, just taking that for granted. But in fact, really from an evolutionary perspective, you can't do that. Rainy Thornhill was one who really pushed us to start thinking about, and he did a lot of the thinking about putting it in a broader phylogenetic perspective. And ultimately what I would say is there became kind of a figure ground shift in the sense that, okay, what's going on in the fertile phase is interesting, but what's evolutionarily novel and really interesting about humans is what's going on outside of it. Any kind of shift has to be understood in terms of what is going on, what's functionally is going on in the fertile phase and what's going on outside of it. So, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to your question <laughs> slowly, right. but the, you know, we, we tried to develop a kind of model for this and what we ultimately called it is a dual sexuality. So it's not so much that there are two discrete phases, but the idea is that there's a conceptive phase and then there's a non-conceptive phase. You wouldn't have a non-conceptive phase of sexuality unless there were some benefits to sex outside of it. In fact, most mammal, mammalian females don't bother with sex outside and males don't bother them either. <laughs> there's, there's no, you know, it's clear when they're conceptive and there's no interest outside. So there's some benefit 
to non-conceptive sex? And that's an interesting question. What is it? Um, what's going on in the fertile phase? The thing is, the idea is from a dual sexuality model is that that's when conception can occur. Females have limited opportunities, uh, mammalian females, limited opportunities to actually reproduce. And so they should be careful and choosy about how they use those reproductive opportunities. And that's going to be foremost for females mid-cycle. Outside of it, well, then there's a the question of what other benefits are they getting, but sexuality should be more geared towards getting those kind of benefits where they don't have to be concerned about conception. Obviously not consciously, but selection would shape that sexuality to be somewhat different. Now, admittedly, because of the way that the, 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 the whole literature developed and, you know, our thinking and so on was, you know, a focus on genetic qualities. That's what became the big, you know, focus of, of, uh, of research and so on, the, the so-called good genes uh, shift, the auditory shift, uh, what, what, what Lars calls it that. Um, and, you know, it, it's my view right now is that it's a very, very mixed literature with regard to that particular shift. Um, I don't know uh, whether it's it's that, you know, because the thing is, again, what we were reporting is what people in general have done. I mean, uh, Ben Jones ultimately couldn't replicate uh, facial, masculinity, facial masculinity shifts, but he was an author on six studies <laughs> that originally showed it. So I, I don't know what happened there. You know, it's, it's hard to know. Ultimately, it's a bit of a mess. And I'm, I'm thinking that, well, it, it, it possibly there are either not shifts or possibly they are very conditional shifts that it depends on who you're talking about what the male characteristics are, the male partner characteristics, what the characteristics of the relationship are, and so on and so forth. That is to be explored. Now, what I will say is that part of what we were debating in the 2019 HBES was really, um, I shouldn't say what we were debating, what Marty and Lars were talking about really was, was whether um, Lars Penke's study had shown then in fact there was not uh, a partner attractiveness moderation effect. So what Marty had done early in the 2000s is some work or mid 2000s. There's a number of different studies continuing on to you know, for for quite a few years. A number of studies claiming to show that how attractive the partner was moderated females' interest in men other than partners. So that if their partner was not so attractive, then they showed an increase in attraction to other men mid-cycle, purportedly mm -hmm. particular other men, you know, highly attractive other men. Lars, in a study with uh, that was led by um, his former graduate student, Ruben Arslan, had claimed that, well, they didn't replicate that. It's... You know, the, the, these matters will continue to be debated, but, but what we had found is a couple of coding errors, and I think that there's good evidence in his study that there is something. But at the same time, you know, I think that we still have to uh, look at this with, with future studies and so on. Now, if there are not preference shifts, but there is the partner attractiveness shift, that begs the question, what is going on? <laughs> you know, one possibility is that it's only those women who are actually showing the shift with partners that are going to show the preference shift. There's no sense in making the, you know, doing the, uh, having a preference shift. If in fact your partner is, is who is, uh, um, who you're most attracted to, like with highly attractive partners. So it's possible that these are highly conditional effects and that, you know, that's an issue to be explored. It is the case that, you know, again, there are these studies that have shown something and uh, there's something called a P-curve analysis to try to detect whether there's any signal there whatsoever. And that seemed to show that there's some signal to the extent that, well, it, for some women, it would show sometimes with a sample, you just by chance, you get the sample of women that show the effect. And then, you know, you are really picking up some signal. So I, I think it's a very confused <laughs> or confusing literature at this point that's yet, that's yet to be settled right 
But if we really do have this preference shift during ovulation, do we know what would be some of the best candidates out there for moderators of that shift? Well, one of the possibilities is yeah. the partner attractiveness. Hmm. One thing that, that, that Randy and I in our book in 2018 mentioned, but unfortunately didn't really develop as well uh, because uh, these ideas were all being, being developed at the time we were writing the book, and I wish we would have developed it more. But we've developed it a little bit more later, and actually this is something that I've, I've you know, uh, invested quite a bit to look at, is relationship qualities. So um, there are a couple of psychologists uh, by the name of uh, Paul Eastwick and Eli Finkel who developed an hypothesis back in the oh, late 2000s, early uh, 2010s, that they called the adaptive workaround hypothesis. Um, the idea is that women who are in highly valuable relationships, highly valued ones, are going to have, you know, with this, you know, temptation to be attracted to men other than their partner mid-cycle, they have an adaptive workaround, which is to actually seek intimacy with their partners. And they have a couple of studies, uh, small samples, so very provisional evidence, but, you know, it's interesting ideas that, that uh, say yes, that, that women who are highly bonded to their partners, they have this strong attachment to the partners. It's a well-developed attachment between the partners, that they actually show some drawing towards their, their partners mid-cycle. And um, that's, uh, Randy and I had discussed it in a slightly different context, in the context of, you know, I, I guess more generally, what one of the things we argued with regard to what's going on mid-cycle is what should go on is women should be caring about sire choice if they're even going to reproduce. Sometimes it's not the right time to reproduce, so you don't want to have sex mid-cycle. But if they are, sire choice becomes uh, an important factor. One of the things that we discussed is that many times the best sire is the partner, the primary partner. Unfortunately, we didn't develop it. That's probably most of the time, actually, because of the way that humans have evolved pair bonding and biparental care and so on. And, you know, the, the thing is there's some risk of losing one's invest, partner's investment uh, if if women are unfaithful. So the idea is that, that, that uh, and, and that unfaithfulness becomes detected. So the way that I would understand it is, is really not just sort of a, 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 a development of the intimacy and a reinforcement of the intimacy of the relationship, but really this is partly about sire choice. We have a big study that we're doing that we're just sort of wrapping up that's looking at this, and uh, we have yet to report these findings. Uh, but, you know, what I will say, and the thing is, whenever I report, say anything that's not published, I want to make sure that, you know, this has to go undergo peer review, et cetera. But what I can say is that in the data that I've seen thus far, there's some evidence that, yeah, if you, women, partners are really strongly attached, that's when females are really strongly drawn to their to their partners. Now, the flip side is that is that when women are in relationships in which they're not strongly attached, which actually <laughs> is, attachment is not that strongly correlated with uh, the relationship length or whether they're living with their partner or whether they're married and so on. There's a whole range of of uh, attachments uh, across couples, uh, no matter no matter what the relationship length is. So it's not just a matter of, you know, these are undeveloped relationships. They're long-standing, they're fairly durable, etc. They're just not this strong attachment. Those women then show more uh, attraction to, to partners other or men other than their partners. Again, you can take that as a hypothesis if you want, <laughs> rather than a finding because it's so preliminary. But that would be the kind of thing that I would want to look at. Right. Right. So in my initial question, I mentioned the fact that if the partnership hypothesis is correct, then women would prefer 
partners that are more physically attractive? I mean, I focused on physical attractiveness, but could there be some psychological traits that would also uh, have that effect? Sure. So, first of all, there might be some indicators of so-called ancestral genetic quality or something. Mm -hmm. Male dominance, behavioral dominance, and so on. That's something that we have looked at. That's something that Lars has looked at and claims that he can't can't replicate. We've got a replication piece in this in this uh, study that we're doing now uh, as well. So we'll we'll see how how that uh, turns out. But in addition to that, yes, I would say that you know it. it, it I, I don't know that I want to say that it's just a, a, a quality of another person. Part of it is a quality of another person in relationship to you. So somebody might be warm, giving, etc. If it's just in general, it's not nearly as valuable as when this is a person who you have an intimate relationship with and what they're particularly is they're warm and giving to you. And maybe discriminately not giving too much to everybody else because you've got this strong bond, okay? So that, I would say, is a relationship quality rather than just a partner characteristic. But the thing is, given a particular relationship, like a, a romantic relationship, a pair bond, there are variations in the qualities and the, 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 that individuals display within that. And yes, I suspect that those things are going to be very important. And as I say, I think that there are a number of people who are sort of interested in looking at this kind of stuff. I just think that it's an unexplored territory. And until we really explore it, we won't fully know what's going on. Because I, I suspect actually that if there is anything to really moderating things strongly and powerfully, this is going to be it, even more so than, let's say, partner attractiveness, even though I think that that might have something to do with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've been talking about the effects that ovulation might have on women's behavior, but what about the effects that it might have on other people? I mean, when we talk about ovulation in human females, you, you we usually say that it's concealed, but is right. that really the case? Right. So I think that's a really interesting question. Um, first of all, I think that the whole issue with regard to the evolution of concealment of ovulation, one has to really, you know, be clear about what we're talking about. Sometimes what is contrasted with that is, oh, like female chimpanzees who have these large sexual swellings that are displayed uh, when they're sexually active. It actually isn't just when they are conceptive because it actually extends beyond that female chimpanzees have an extended sexuality as well. It's just not as extended as humans. So they're having lots of sex with males outside of that fertile phase. And that plays a certain function within chimpanzees. It's probably very different than humans. But in any case, that sometimes is what is talking about. Oh, there aren't these big fertility cues that, that women are displaying. But the thing is, in, even in species that don't have those kind of displays, many primate species, but also a lot of mammalian species. They don't have these displays and so on. Nonetheless, males can detect when they are fertile. And, and typically, this is an argument that Randy and I made, uh, building on others' uh, contributions and so on. Typically, what the females don't actually have to pay the cost of displaying that, as long as there are some byproducts. Uh, the main byproducts that I think uh, occur within mammals and perhaps humans as well to some extent is scent. So it may well be that you know that given the the, the chemistry that is uh, the internal chemistry that's regulating conceptive you know, cycles, including hormones and probably hormones and what they're affecting byproducts, et cetera, et cetera, there might be these chemical signatures that males can detect. Males would be strongly selected to detect female conceptive status, okay? So typically males can do a pretty good job. In fact, even in chimpanzees where there are these sexual swellings, the more reliable indicator is if they can get a good uh, sniff. They'll, they'll, the, the, when they are actually conceptive is, is uh, they, they don't necessarily just attend to what the sexual swelling looks like. They'll attend to what the true hormonal status of females are, suggesting that there's something else that they're actually picking up Mostly it's scent. They spend a lot of time sniffing around 
females. So, and that's probably true again in, in lots of species. So when we talk about concealed ovulation, we aren't just talking about, oh, the lack of these signals. We're actually talking about potentially the suppression of these cues. So the idea is that, well, maybe men can't detect, uh, perhaps there's been some selection in females to suppress these cues. Um, I'll say a bit more about that in just a second. And that men, men can't detect it nearly as well as say chimpanzees can detect female. And I actually tend to believe that, although it's a hard, hard to test that exactly. Uh, quite frankly, because of so much, many differences in how the propinquity of chimpanzees around each other. I mean, there's a group living in a, in a closer, you know, uh, closer living conditions and so on than, than we have and so on, particularly in modern uh, societies. Now, why would women be selected to suppress these cues? Well, I think in general, to the extent that there's extended sexuality, most of those benefits are going to be leveraged by males or perhaps females as well. There's some suggestion that maybe female aggression also plays a role in, in suppressing these cues and so on because females might be aggressive towards uh, females who are conceptive. But it's all leveraged by no one really knowing exactly where a female stands. Okay. And that happens again, even in chimpanzees, they don't know exactly where they stand. That's how females can use extended sexuality to get certain benefits. Mostly there, I think it's paternity confusion is what they're doing. They're mating with lots of males so that no one can really rule out that they're the father, but then really <laughs> they're mating with the dominant male. Sometimes it's almost coercive that they're mating with a, do a dominant, a dominant male uh, when they're conceptive. So there's some, not everyone has equal chance of being the sire and indeed, Dominant males tend to, you know, they, they, uh, by far and away, sire most of the offspring within the group. So with with humans, I think it's a, it's a different benefit, but I think there's a good conceptual argument to be made that there's actually a suppression of these cues. So not only the lack of these visual signs, but actually a suppression of cues. Now that said, there's possibly limits to what kind of suppression, how much suppression you can get because the chemistry is not going to change. There's still going to be estrogens and progesterones and so on. And there can still be some of that that leaks out. I think it was, it was uh, Gildersleeve and, and Hazelton who uh, used the term leaky cues. These are leaky cues that, that males and potentially others are actually picking up. Um, and indeed there are a number of studies that show that men, and actually women, <laughs> basically they prefer the scent of, of women who are closer to their uh, conceptive phase, when, when estradiol would be high and progesterone would be low. So suggesting that, well, okay, there is some cue that they're, they're picking up. So that's not to say that females are advertising their conceptive status, I would say exactly the opposite. They're probably suppressing, per suppressing, but they're not able to suppress totally. And, you know, admittedly, that is partly based on a more general conceptual argument to be tied in with all of our understanding about why, why, why extended sexuality evolved in humans and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, but since other people can pick up on some cues that a particular woman might be ovulating, when women are exposed to other women that are ovulating and their partner is next to them, I mean, do they resort to, for example, some mate guarding strategies? It's a possibility. I, I think that that would be really interesting to look at and explore in, in more detail. There's a bit of literature on that. I think that it's a bit mixed right now. There's some suggestion that women are more assertive and so on mid-cycle. Uh, my own sense is it might be one of these things that once again, it's going to be very conditional on, you know, how secure they are in their relationship. Uh, the extent to which that they, yeah, they're, they, 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 uh, worry about uh, worry about being deserted or about uh, 
men being attracted to, to other women and so on and so forth. So I, I don't know that it's going to be a one size fits all, which means that it's going to be difficult to, I mean, it's, it's more challenging to detect those kind of patterns. You've got to try to identify what the right variables are that are going to moderate that. Um, but that would be my suspicion more that it would be that it would be that. Mm -hmm. And do we know if there are any big sex differences when it comes to propensity to to get involved in extra pair copulations? Oh, I I have actually I have little doubt that men are more likely to be involved in extra pair uh, and more interested. They're more pursuing of that on the average uh but of course that's on the average so i'm not saying that there's a template that fits men and there's a template that fits women once again it's going to be highly conditional i think that the men are uh, uh many men are very very faithful and they're selected to be very very faithful because that that's that's their best strategy to be highly invested in in their own partner and offspring and so on and so forth but on the average yes i think that men are more more likely to, and I think that you know there are good evolutionary reasons or you know selectionist, adaptationist reasons why that would be the case. That women are taking greater chances and so on with with losing investment from a partner if she is um, sexually unfaithful. Mm -hmm. And do we know if people are good at detecting if their partner is having? extra pair copulations or if they're having an affair and or are romantically or sexually involved with another person um that's a good question um i don't know that we know that totally you know um my guess is that um there's probably some validity to what they they sense there's probably some validity but my guess is as well there are going to be uh some errors some of those errors might be um, somewhat defensive and protective, that if you have any suspicion at all, I'm not saying that you do uh, think for sure that someone is having an affair, but rather they, you, you have suspicion, then, then you, you, um, you might uh, uh, engage in more mate guarding, et cetera, et cetera, uh, even if, if it, if it if, uh, yeah, you don't know for sure. So um, I, I think there's a bit of evidence that suggests that, yeah, there's there's that kind of thing. There's uh, an over overestimation bias. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I know that I could speak to that uh, definitively. Okay. Uh, and in terms of the evolution of uh, human physical attractiveness, why is it that uh, men and women are drawn to certain physical traits in the opposite sex? I mean, what, what is the best way of understanding it from an evolutionary perspective? Yeah. My own view on this is that physical attractiveness is, in a sense, a composite. So it, it, physical attractiveness doesn't mean one thing. <laughs> it, it really is a composite. It really is... What physical attractiveness is, it's, it's really characterizing more the responses of others rather than saying something definitive about what the person is. Um, so, you know, my sense is that, yes, so let's say with regard to female physical attractiveness, uh, which, you know, in humans, uh, physical attractiveness in females is, is uh, uh, there's an unusual pattern in that typically in, in most mammals, certainly, that it's not the, the females who are, you know, seen as highly physically attractive, and maybe males are not discriminating as much on the basis of these physical features. In women, you do see that, and, and you know, the, that's been, ex, you know, uh, discussed extensively with regard to it reflecting something about reproductive value in terms of how many years of reproduction they have left, something about uh, their fertile status or the status of fertility status not just in uh, with regard to the cycle now but more generally with regard to their health uh with regard to their capacity to uh, um, gestate and lactate uh, 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 an offspring so on and so forth so all of those things can play a role in physical attractiveness per se but exactly what you know the, it might be certain cues, features that that actually feed into that. 
Um, you know, just to take an example of why, you know, the thing is there are multiple cues. Once people get to know each other better, they actually think that they're more physically attractive, particularly if they're favorable interactions. Why is that? <laughs> well, you know, again, there's something else that's feeding in. Okay, now I, I, I recognize your particular face as someone who is uh, a beneficial interaction partner, as I, I find that, that, that more attractive in a, in a general sense, and it, whether it be in a sexual or a non-sexual context. Um, so there are particular, uh, there are, there are a number of different factors. Now we, we can, we can ask, well, what are the main, main contributors the, the, with regard to male physical attractiveness? It is true that the way that it's sometimes presented in, I think somewhat simplistic terms, but it's, it's, you know, it's revealing something about genetic quality, that it's uh, something about health and robustness and, uh, and, and that's what it's really revealing. There probably is something to that in that your overall health and capacity to have developed and perhaps uh, your uh, development that's contingent on what your what your uh, own competitive abilities have been through adolescence and so forth somehow have some impact on physical features that then can be taken as cues. But I don't think that's all of it. You know, again, I think there are general health cues. I mean, you get sick, you don't look as good. <laughs> so there can be very immediate kind of changes here. Um, and once again, there can also be these factors that, such as getting to know one uh, uh, another better. It may well be that romantic partners, after they've been together for a long time, come to value their partner's attractiveness and overvalue that relative to what others are. I shouldn't say overvalue, but value it more than what others would who don't have that interaction history. So I think there are probably a lot of things that feed in and it's an interesting question as to, to what what uh, what feeds in to what extent and whether there are specific features that have particular kinds of meaning that we don't always discriminate. You know, so we talk physical attractiveness again. It's an amalgamation, and so on. So uh, we can talk about, let's say, something like facial averageness. So it is the case that, on average, faces that deviate a lot from the average are not seen as a, as attractive. What is that telling us, as opposed to um, uh, attractive facial expressions or attractive, you know, things that are sexually dimorphic that are they're highly different, like you know, more dominant or masculine faces or feminine faces and so on and so forth. Um, so I think we can make some guesses, but I don't know that we definitively know exactly what what uh, feeds into all of that at this point. Right. Do the physical traits that men and women prefer in the opposite sex, uh, I mean, are they universal or do they vary a lot cross-culturally? Um, my guess is it's kind of a mix, depends. Uh, I think that uh, indicators of healthiness and so on, I think are probably going to be, and by here I'm talking like skin texture and so on and so forth, probably going to be fairly universal. I don't know how widely that has been examined. But certainly there are some variations uh, in terms of, let's say, with regard to facial masculinity in men, there's some variations that have been discovered and there are there's interest in identifying what kind of culture societies particularly value masculinity in men and so on and so forth so uh, so I think it's a, it's a mix of both um, and then you know it also can be the case I think that you know some of this like with regard to what is you know, in, in what places facial masculinity is particularly preferred that might be able to under, be understood in terms of adaptive you know a reasoning what what are men's roles what is the, what is the nature of pair bonding in that in that society how much uh what, what's the disease load etc cetera, etc cetera. uh and and some of that stuff has been explored it's also possible i think that you know within particular cultures you can get exaggerations that just sort of run away that I would, don't know that I understand it as adaptive per se, even though it's kind of piggybacking on something that might be adaptation. So you have, you know, um, uh, certain kinds of modifications and so on that that create these supernormal stimuli and so on that that might be 
attractive within a particular group, but they come to be attracted within that group over time and so on as an exaggeration. But if they introduced into another group, they wouldn't necessarily be attractive. Mm -hmm. And those body mod modifications, do they follow along the physical traits that men and women tend to prefer in the opposite sex? Or is it something... Certainly that I, well, I think that certainly there are ones that, that do uh, to... Um, certainly there are ones that do and, and probably there are ones that don't. Um, so with regard to, let's say, you can take a look at something like uh, use of cosmetics. Um, I say female. Uh, uh, eyeshadow and so on, like enlarge the eyes, uh, bring out the whiteness of the eyes, which might be an indicator of health, and possibly change what the, the, the apparent uh, uh, proportions of the face are. Uh, using uh, ruddier tones might be uh, associated with uh, um, uh, health of the face as opposed to paler. But, you know, again, you, you find, you know, there's there's variation uh, where in some places there are probably, sometimes, it you know, you, you probably have modifications in some cases that are actually not necessarily chosen by the person who is doing it to reveal something. You have modifications that is imposed by them, by let's say the other sex, to not reveal something. You know, I mean, an example that's not a modification exactly of the body would be, be veiling and so on in some highly pater, uh, uh, paternalistic sort of societies, where here now females are not going to reveal anything. You know? <laughs> uh, and there might be certain kinds of modifications that would be like cosmetics and so on that are imposed as well to do the same. Um, having only, you know, sort of white shades of, of cosmetics. I mean, I, that's just an example. I, that's, that I don't know that that's something, mm -hmm. what to make of it. So I, I think there are, I think it, it's probably somewhat complicated, you know, in terms of what, what, what these things are actually uh, doing. Mm -hmm. Right. So I have a couple of final topics I would like to explore, and these are more general ones having to do with evolutionary psychology. So what is the best way to understand how different uh, psychological traits have evolved? I mean, do we st should we start by thinking that they are adaptations or, I mean, are there other approaches? For example, in your work, I've read you writing about uh, exaptationism. Could you tell us about that? Well, the way that I would understand adaptationism, quite frankly, is really more as a as a methodology rather than as a commitment. You know, I think that some of the criticism of adaptationism was really the, the idea that, well, we can't assume that everything is an adaptation. So when you go in, assume, hey, listen, you could be wrong and, and you're imposing, you're just making up stories and so on and so forth. I see it more as a method as a methodology. OK. Certain things have evolved through adaptation, okay? There are many, many features that are not adaptations. Um, they're byproducts of adaptations, or they might be just, you know, other kinds of incidental, yeah, they're incidental effects. So the exact, I mean, uh, the distance between your nose and your kneecap, that's not itself highly adaptive. However, proportionality and so on, and growth plates, you know, it's, it's really a byproduct of adaptation. What Williams, in his classic adaptationism book, Adaptation and Natural Selection in 1966, you know, argued that, I mean, not just argue, I mean, asserted with argument that adaptation is an onerous concept. We really have to establish um, that something is an adaptation. There is a, uh, we, we want to show that something has a, a particular special design for doing what a, a particular for achieving a certain kind of benefit before we say, hey, this is an adaptation. So I see adaptationism as, as kind of doing that, identifying, okay, what, what are the design features and so on? What are the special design features? There are many things that are not uh, going to be adaptations. Once again, they're going to be byproducts. You know, I gave an example before with regard to the scent of women. I don't think it's a 
an adaptation for attracting men uh, because, you know, signaling that you're fertile. I think the better argument is that it's actually a byproduct. It's just, you know, scent that's, you know, emitted through the skin and so on. There's no special uh, organ that's actually pumping out. You know, <laughs> there's no real clear evidence that there's any special design for that. So I see I would take that as a, a byproduct. The thing is, it's very difficult to say, you know, take, let's say uh, I have, a, you know, to let's say develop a research program that says, well, I'm going to identify byproducts. That's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to assume that everything's a byproduct. And everything. Well, the thing is, in doing that, you first have to understand what the adaptation is, because <laughs> the byproduct is always a byproduct of something like an adaptation. Right. Um, now, there are things that I think that, you know, I actually think that the concept of adaptation or acceptation is an interesting one. The concept of ad acceptation is that you have something that is um, has evolved for a particular function, and now, technically, without modification, without modification to that particular trait itself, it is put to is put to a new purpose. Very often, there's some kind of adaptation that has evolved to put it to a new purpose. Um, but it's just it's just not that particular trait, you know, <clears throat> and I think that, that an example that that Gould and Verba in their classic article on acceptation from, I think, 1982, an example that they give is the heron's wing. So it's evolved for flight. However, the heron can use it to shade the water to then be able to see what's underneath, you know, to, to, to reduce the glare on the water to be able to catch prey fish. And uh, the thing is, the wing hasn't actually evolved to be different. So it's been put to a new use. There's some ad adaptation that's probably in the brain you know, <laughs> that puts it to that use, but it's not, it's not the wing itself. So I think it's an interesting concept. And sometimes, yes, things, we, we, we have to understand that, that things can have benefits that, it haven't, that, that they haven't actually evolved to, to uh, that benefit hasn't actually shaped the trade itself. And I, I do think it's interesting. However, I would still say that to understand that best, we use a methodology of adaptation. Let's first of all understand what the trade has actually evolved to do. Let's understand the special design of it. With a wing, we can understand the special design is for flight and so on. Now when we see that it's used for something else, aha, we can see it hasn't necessarily been modified for that. We can see that, aha, it has the same shape as similar kind of birds and aren't using that, that kind of uh, trade. So, and so best we can tell, it hasn't been modified for that. And so now we say, okay, that new purpose, that new benefit is, uh, is exacted rather than there being an adaptation for it. We need the adaptationist methodology, that approach, to even understand byproducts or acceptation. That's that I guess that's my view. So mm -hmm. it's a methodology. It's not a general assumption about everything is adaptive. Right. I understand. Okay, so one final question. How do you look at the relationship between life history theory and evolutionary psychological theory, let's say? Right. So the way that I understand life history theory is in a broader way, perhaps, than some evolutionary psychologists do, but you know that may be that may be wrong. I used to understand life history theory as really a very broad general theory for understanding selection. Um, the the basic uh, the basic insight. Of, I mean, the thing is, I, I would say that theoretical biology, in a sense, really took off, expanded uh, when 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 biologists really started using almost kind of economic uh, cost benefit kind of uh, thinking about about the evolution of traits and so on, each trait has a benefit. It also has costs. Some of those are opportunity costs. Those some of those are actually costs that, that are imposed on on the individual itself because it's attracting predators or wherever it might be. And now what we do is we try to model model what the selection process would actually favor okay so we we, we try to use uh, modeling adaptation or uh, cost benefit sort of analysis really almost kind of economic analysis where the where the currency is really fitness 
um, to understand evolution. I would say a life history theory in a broad sense is really an extension, expansion of that, or it's, it's really, it's life history theory incorporates that, but within a, a, a broader kind of framework. So the idea is in part that each trait that we allocate energy to, each trait that we develop and so on, the fitness of that is going to be a function of that the impact of that in terms of benefits and costs integrated through the whole life course. So we can't think of it just in terms of the instantaneous benefit or cost. We have to think about it in terms of how it's integrated across the whole life course. How does it affect fertility and, and, and <laughs> viability for, uh, and survival functions through the whole life course? And integrate that, and you know, then that, that's that's how you, that's how fitness plays out. Okay, so the the impact of of any kind of allocation, it it has to be understood in in that broader sense. Now, the way that life history is oftentimes you know discussed within biology is really to understand particular kinds of problems with regard to that, and notably, basically most of them uh, or uh, many of them can be captured by uh, the idea of just basically capturing variation in the pace of life. So we know there are organisms that, you know, live a day, <laughs> even, you know, invertebrates that live a day. Uh, they never have to feed and so on because they only live a day. And then we have organisms that live a long, long, long time. And even within taxa, within mammals, we have organisms that live a year or six months. And then we have ones that, that by live, uh, uh, over 100 years. So how we understand that, 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 you know, how did selection give rise to such varying kinds of life forces? You know, and the idea of life history theory is that, you know, it has to be understood in terms of, well, what is a, um, broadly speaking, again, what selection is going to favor is it's going to favor uh, a maximum amount of, of allocation of effort to reproductive effort overall. That's a broad kind of concept. And, you know, for different organisms in different niches and so on, that's going to play out differently. So I see it in that very, very broad way. And so I think that evolutionary psychology really draws its inspiration from these kind of evolutionary models and so on. Um, Evolutionary psychology is not such that, well, you take a certain understanding of evolution and you just, or there is a theory of evolution and you just derive certain things. No, the evolution is a very contingent outcome and it's contingent on exactly what the conditions of selection are and so on. So you can't necessarily say that, well, you know, again, if you take a look at most birds and so on, you'd say that, well, males are the ones that should be most attractive and so on. But in humans, Physical attractiveness is, you know, that men men care more about it than women, than, than vice versa. So, what are the contingencies that led to that in humans, as opposed? To, so we, we draw upon inspiration. So life history thinking is 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 a source of that. Now, more generally, however, I mean, and more specifically, however, the way that people have understood it once again is sort of in terms of variations across individuals in pace of life, or individuals in different groups in pace of life. So, so kind of fast life histories, reproducing relatively early, transitioning fairly early, and then um, putting less effort into actually survival, so dying earlier and so on. And all of that I think is, is very interesting. I think there's a lot of debate in the literature right now about how it all works out. Um, what has been claimed to be some of the fast life history traits, which is perhaps being more uh, uh, allocating more effort to mating, uh, less to parenting, and so on. That doesn't necessarily go along with what is considered to be kind of a classic marker of of transition to um, well, what is a classic marker of transition to the reproductive state in females, which is menarche. Age of menarche is not really tied to that. So I think some rethinking has to be done quite frankly. Uh, so I think that there's a, once again, this is another area where I think that it's a, we're in a state of transition to, to understanding this all better. But I, I do think that it's, that there'll be some important insights from, from, uh, from thinking about, uh, 
uh, about things from a, from a life history standpoint, but thinking about development and the pace of life from a life history standpoint. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Gangstad, just before we go, would you like to mention any places on the internet where people can find your work? Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the main thing would be, uh, I, I am on, uh, I do have some stuff posted on research. Um, I'm not always real good, I haven't, I haven't been in the past real good about posting everything, but I'm going to try to get a lot better. So it'd be on ResearchGate. Also, I'm on Google Scholar and uh, certainly my most recent stuff. But some of the, the unpublished stuff that I have is, is uh, I'll be public, uh, putting on, on ResearchGate. Um, my website at, at the University of New Mexico, I haven't really completely updated all of that and so on, and particularly as I'm, I'm trans, uh, emeritus and, and transitioning from there. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, ResearchGate, find, find me on there, Stephen Yangstead. Okay, so Dr. Gangstad, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Well, thanks a lot, Ricardo. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed it. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. My channel is now more than three years old, and to keep it sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you prefer PayPal, you can also find links to it in the description box of this interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Pereira Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan V. Selenian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbord, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Erika Lenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassi, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Pinha, Phil Kavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Please, Miran B, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Kian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardas France, and Niruban Balachandran. And finally, my executive producers, Michel Ruzieski, Rosie, James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.